Okay. Good morning, everybody. I guess I should start this video saying it's Hanukkah, which is one of the days we're not allowed to say Hespin. Not allowed to say eulogies. So it's not a eulogy. It's not a Hespin. Um, not really. Even though it's it's... It's a certain sense of disconnect because today is a national day of mourning. And yet our faith prohibits us from mourning. But I insist that my nation is America. Judaism is my faith, it's my religion, it's my way of life. It's not my national identity, although I know for certain Jewish people that's how they characterize their Jewishness, including religious people. Um, to me, my national identity is, is American, and I believe biblically there is there is you know support for that concept. Moses was called an Egyptian. Uriah the Hittite, Doeg the Edomite, even though Doeg the Edomite is not certainly, certainly not a person that we want to emulate. But they, they were called Hittites and Edomites not because of their ancestry, but because of where they resided. <coughs> As Moses was called by his future wife and, <coughs> and in-laws an Egyptian man. So I'm an American, even though culturally part of the beauty of America is that there is, it's e pluribus unum, out of many there is one, there is unity, like Glenn Beck has been talking about recently, we have to find that unum and still preserve the pluribus. that we live in a pluralistic society that contains a certain level of union. We have to, we have to find that balance. And how exactly we find the balance and so forth, it's, it is what it is. And so, in the plural, plural, pluralistic aspect of my identity, it's a day of, not a day of joy as much as a day of thanksgiving and praise. And in Judaism, these things are defined in legalistic matters, as most things in Judaism are, uh, including uh, issues of faith are also essentially legal matters. that in a negative way that, that certain critics of our faith um, might intend it. I just mean it in a factual way. And so thanksgiving and praise are specifically issues of liturgy. That, that's how we uh, that's how we manage it. And in that way, the unum that America re represents that today, we are called to be united in mourning. President George H.W. Bush um, is called unity more than a Although it's a day of mourning, it's 
not a day of unhealthy, excessive mourning. I don't think anybody is engaging in that, although certain people might be, I don't know. But certainly, a day of thanksgiving and praise. And we're thankful to God and praising God that we have someone, a human being, who is worthy of thanksgiving and praise. That we have to, because he was a man who exuded thanksgiving and praise. His whole life was one of service and of humility, graciousness, gratitude, and positivity for the most part, trying to. When, when it was appropriate, which was most of the time. And even when he was negative, it was still with the modicum of respect. That was his way of approaching things. I'm not saying that in any way <clears throat> to criticize people who have a different way. Because e pluribus unum, we out of the plurality of different types of temperaments and so forth, we still share certain aspects of unity. And so there are certain people who their modicum of service and so forth is one of a little bit different type of attitude. And that's okay. see that President Bush left behind. You know, <clears throat> he was the second president to serve in my lifetime. I was born during the Reagan administration. And I have some memories of that, but I have very profound memories of the Bush administration. very clear memories of the Bush administration. I was already five years old until I was about nine years old. these aspects. I, I have a first cousin uh, who was actually President Bush's chauffeur. So that's something I remember, you know, very distinctly seeing the pictures in my grandpa's um, home. My grandpa being someone from that generation, a little a little older, not much, about the same age, a few years older than President Bush, and, um, you know, the pride that my grandpa had, that he had a grandson who, you know, in the pictures of my cousin together uh, with the president, that was certainly special. Although, I'll be honest with you, in these past few days, I've learned things I think maybe we all have about President Bush that we didn't know perhaps we have a little um, play on words in the 
Jewish tradition, you know, uh, each week we have liturgical readings from the Pentateuch, from the Torah, and uh, they they go through an annual cycle. And so there's we what we tend to do is we give a name. And this is this is you know several centuries old, really, but older. And we, we named that week's Torah portion by one of the first words in the portion, or one or two of the first words. And, um, so three, and, and three weeks in a row, out usually sometime in the spring. It's not exactly, you know, like for example now Mikates usually comes around Hanukkah. And it's Hanukkah now. So uh, in the spring we'll have Acharemos, Kedoshim, Emor. Those usually fall around Passover time, but that's not really what we're talking about now. So those are three, three weeks in a row. I, I mean, it's interrupted. The liturgical readings are interrupted for Passover. Um, so, Achare Mos means after death. Kedoshim, holy ones, we should be holy. So, uh, Amor, we say that, you know, after, so, with the, with, it's kind of a play on words, we kind of say, you know, after someone dies, all of a sudden, you know, we say they're holy. And in President Bush's humility, he he really let people. I don't mean this because he was a he was a warrior, and yet to a certain extent, uh, people. I don't know if he let people walk all over him, or people realized what exactly was going on. But people people walked all over him. Um. And yet he was able to accomplish great, great things despite that. He was a man of tremendous accomplishments, including in his presidency, and yet they go, they were widely ignored for a long time. And, um, you know, now... Um, you know, they're getting some attention that they didn't get back in the day. Um, which they should have. He deserved recognition for his accomplishments. And instead, you know, he was, as presidents tend to be, you know, a butt of jokes and stuff, but, and he stood up, you know, I mean, proud, one of the most endearing memories I had, and, and, you know, this was played, I forgot who played it, I think it was, uh, Sean Hannity, um, but, you know, Dana Carvey, um, portrayed President Bush on Saturday Night Live, and uh, one day President Bush, you know, called him and, you know, argued with him about, you know, how exaggerated his impressions were. And, and uh, they, Dana Carvey stayed in character and they had a whole dialogue between the, the real President Bush and the, and the, t the TV parody. You know, certainly he was not considered to be a guy who was cool, and yet there was something cool about that, you know, I mean, it's the same thing, like, you know, people would think of Nixon, he wasn't very cool the way, you know, May Kennedy was cool, you know, or Clinton or Obama were cool, you know, and now we have a, a cool Republican president who, um, 
and they, and they, and they won't let him be cool, you know, like he is, he is a Republican, pre the president we have now has a temperament of a Democrat, a lot of the ideology and certain, to a certain extent of certain Democrat ideas. <laughs> and yet they hate him even more because he's he's stepping on their toes. The thing is, Hillary Clinton is not a cool person, you know. I mean, it's funny how you know all of a sudden Bernie Sanders is like the cool guy, and he he's not cool either, you know. But like, the thing is, is that President Bush was. Someone said he was regal. He was royal. And that, you know, to a certain extent, we're not supposed to have royalty in America. And, you know, President Trump is really what, really what the founders intended, even though, you know, uh, President, you know, President Washington did set precedents of... Nobility sans nobility in the presidency, but there were presidents like Jefferson, and as much as I'm not a fan, but Andrew Jackson, who was very popular, uh, but who was a horrible person, who, who, who had a different. Uh, approach in, in the presidency. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big admirer, though, of, of Jefferson, and, and Jefferson was very upset with Jackson. He was very uncomfortable when he heard about Jackson, but you know, the, the historic value of, of a president like Trump It's not meant to forget about the, uh, it, it's no insult to President Trump to note that President Bush was different. And yet President Bush respected President Trump. He made sure that he would be involved in the funeral. He did not want the funeral to turn into some kind of political circus the way some recent and not, not only one reason, one in particular, but the, over the years, senatorial funerals. Um, have turned into political circuses. He was a man of honor, respect. Recently, it's interesting, you know, before... Before uh, President Reagan passed, I mean, before President Bush passed away, I watched a video with uh, several rabbonim. I don't know what the occasion was, but going to visit President Reagan and the, the, the current Satmar Rebbe from Brooklyn, from Salman Leib Teitelbaum, who, who I've met on a few occasions, uh, was there to read the No Saint Chua, the prayer for the government. Uh, for President Reagan. And it was cute. It was interesting to see. Um, and then after President Bush passed away, they had pretty much the same scene with President Bush um, with the current Sabra Rebbe, the older brother, the older Rebbe, um, from Monroe um, in that same role. And the thing that struck me was how President Bush was like, it was like the way he was conducting himself, it was, it was like Mr. Rogers. One of my colleagues from another institution 
he said something recently uh, yesterday at a meeting we were at. He said, uh, he said, well, his goal in, in life is to be as much like Mr. Rogers as possible. <coughs> and this guy's not like Mr. Rogers. That's the interesting thing. Which I think shows that he's working on himself. Um, President Bush was like naturally like that, as Mr. Rogers was, who was really the Reverend Dr. Rogers. Uh, and yet they just called him Mr. Rogers, you know? And it was that type of thing, that type of humility. Here he's the commander in chief, but he wore his. His uh, military flight jacket was was his rank that he that he earned in World War II and not and not commander in chief. I just heard that on the radio just now. That type of humility that even though he was the, Re the Reverend Doctor Fred Rogers, he was Mister Rogers, and even though he was the commander in chief, he was still just Mister President. He was exceedingly humble. And yet he accomplished great things. And I would say, it's unfortunately, that the, the people didn't recognize that. I mean, at the time, I remember, I remember the re-election campaign, and there was kids picked the president. <coughs> um, on on Nickelodeon, and I remember that that very clearly in 1988. I'm sorry, in 1992, kids picked a president. I remember in 88 too, but I remember it more in 92. I remember when Ross Perot went on the TV. He had bought out, you know, for some kind of campaign speech, and he bought out prime time on all the networks. And my father saying, oh, that's going to be our next president, Ross Perot. And Obviously, uh, that didn't happen, um, and I was very interested in Ross Perot. I, not that I knew that much about him, you know, as a nine-year-old kid, eight-year-old kid, but it was—he—he he fascinated me, and I was—I. I, felt that, you know, if the, at the time, you know, with the Kids Pick the President thing, I don't know if I actually ever sent any postcard for Kids Pick the President, but I, if I did, I'm pretty sure, it might have been a phone call or something, I don't remember how it worked, Kids Pick the President, but I, I was all in for Ross Perot, you know, and at this point in my life, I probably would have voted for George Bush, but the thing is, is, uh, you know, hindsight is 2020, and, you know, I mean, there were all kinds of always conspiracy theories and all kinds of negative things, you know, and not only that he was a butt of jokes, but people really believed that this man was something, uh, different than what he was, and that he was portraying something different, um, and I, I enjoy hearing about conspiracy theories and things, and uh, some of them are pretty weird, but to these issues. We, 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 it's, 
I'm happy I didn't hear any of that stuff. You know, although I'm sure there's going to be... I'm sure I'm going to hear about it later. But, uh... It's... It's really hard to talk about this. Because it's... I'd much rather sit and listen than talk, so, uh, and I, I hope I'll have some time at some point to, uh, to listen to some of the eulogies and some, or at least part of them, the important parts. Um, but I certainly was touched by two things, the same things that Glenn Beck brought up, but maybe some of my viewers aren't following Glenn Beck, but there was a, I think it was in USA Today, it was a, it was a, a cartoon that had, I said Bush arrived in heaven with his airplane, and he had a little girl who had died she was a little, very young with cancer, and she was three years old or five years old. And the little girl together with Barbara Bush and said, we waited for you. And then the other thing was, Don't standing up to salute President Bush, who was who was his rival in the in the thing, and the he was his rival in the in the primary, and, and he stood up. He paralyzed everything to salute. All right, well, thank you for watching. God bless. Please like, share, and subscribe, and comment. I will see you all later.